Before we get into the interview with Her Serene Highness Princess Gloria von Tolman Taxis, I'd like to bring to your attention our website, adgloriamday3.org. We have teamed up with the Fraternity of St. John and are working on a number of projects that might interest you. We'll be continually updating the website with resources and information about our work. You can now also request Masses in the Roman Rite 1962. If you have any questions, then please do email us and we'd be happy to help. We've recently just started a Patreon and I'd appreciate your support if you could contribute to our work with a small donation to make all of our ambitions possible. Also, we'll provide other links to our other social medias and the network groups of Catholics which we have started. Now, without further ado, here's the interview with Her Serene Highness. Today the Confraternity is very privileged and honoured to be able to meet and talk with Her Serene Highness Princess Gloria on Turn and Taxes. A well-known supporter of Catholic causes and known for her devotion and works of charity. Firstly, as a representative of the Confraternity, I'd like to thank you for your time you have offered us and assure you of our prayers from our members worldwide. So, Your Serene Highness, what attracts you to Catholicism and where did you begin your journey? Before I answer your question, I want to say, uh, to apologize for having ordered something to eat, but I have a late lunch today. I didn't have lunch yet. So is it okay if I... Of course. No, yes, feel free. I mean... Okay. So no Catholicism, choice. my family from my father's side come from Saxony. Nice. And in Saxony it was a Protestant area, but in 1800... 19, wait, 100 years last year, yes, in 1818, they decided, no, sorry, in 1918, oh. in 1918, no, in 1890, they decided to become Catholic on a journey in Rome, they were on a trip to Rome, my great-great-grandfather and his, my great-great-great-grandmother and they had separately this inner voice telling them you need to convert but because it was very Protestant they didn't dare to talk to each other about this and somehow in a church which is called um, the Church of the Miraculous um, Ponto Perpetuo, the, the ever, ever, forever help, the mother of a perpetual help. Perpetual help on a Via Merolana. They talked to each other and they were so relieved to find out that they both had the same idea at the same time. So the family converted and it was, they were got persecuted after that in, in Saxony because of the employees of the castle were not allowed a direct access to the castle anymore. So the police stopped because they are Catholics now, they cannot walk this street, they have to go, you have to walk around and, and, and of course they were not invited anymore, anywhere, the, 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 the count and the countess. And so it was for them really very very difficult but they never ever questioned their faith despite the social and also business persecution they had to suffer in saxony so the other day we celebrated the anniversary to become catholics in our family now in all convert families you take the religion extra serious and so was also my my family were, I, I, we were brought up in the morning prayer, at, at before you eat a prayer, and go to bed with a prayer. With my, our parents, we went to church on Sunday, and we celebrated all the holidays, our names day, the saint that we were, uh, and of course uh, the, the, the the big holidays, Assumption or Mary's Assumption or. Uh, of course, Pentecost and Easter, of course, Christmas, and all the holidays were always held up high in our family. In my mother's family also, my mother is Hungarian, and also in her family, and her mother was a Russian Orthodox, 
also religion play, play, played a big role. So I am in I died in a wool Catholic child, yeah. and I was very lucky about that. No, incredibly, and uh, especially the tenacity that your family showed to keep the faith in all the faith of that person. Oh, despite despite they were so nasty to them in those days. Today you cannot imagine anymore that this was a case, but it was like this in the in the early twentieth in the late nineteenth century in the early. 20th century, let me say, guys. Anyway, that's that's how I came to the. And then, not, of course, I, like, like like all young people, when I was young, I didn't. Uh, I practiced, but I wasn't really thinking about it until when rainy days came, when my husband passed away, and I had to deal with a lot of problems. I went, started to go to church every day also to get the strength, the strength to be able to deal with the challenges of everyday life. Yeah, that's, that's really good that you managed to, to find that comfort within the church, rather than... Mm -hmm. uh, Somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. There is nowhere else. Not true comfort, indeed. So, obviously being incredibly very busy, you know, you're, you're fitting in lunch and uh, traveling around uh, even today, you know, you've very graciously given me the time to, to see you. How do you find time for the spiritual life? And uh, do you have any recommendations for other people that are living busy, busy lives? It's all about having a day routine in the day. I always say, like, people go to the gym today. They go to the gym first thing in the morning. Now, what I do first thing in the morning, I talk to God. I have my morning prayer in the breviary. Mm. I have an easier breviary for, um, from, uh, for, from Our Lady. The Our Lady breviary is shorter, so in the morning I pray the, my, my Our Lady breviary and then I start the day. And I will go to Mass if I can, daily, if, if I find the church. Mostly I find it because also a challenge to find the church. Especially in, in countries where your Christianity is not the first one. But then it doesn't, maybe sometimes it will be in the morning or also in the afternoon. But the most important thing is to start the day with God and to finish the day with God. And that's you always find the time. That's wonderful, yes. Um, so the Holy Mother Church has such a rich liturgical patrimony with many different rites of Mass. Which do you mostly attend, and why do you attend that, that rite rather than any other? Mm. I like the old rite personally, but needless to say, I attend every rite because if you go to, if you travel a lot like me, and if you want to find a church and a mass time, you have to take what you get. Yes. And so I'm almost, um, I find everywhere a church, and I find everywhere. A valid mass. Sometimes I will not like it very much because they scream too loud or there is too much clapping and dancing. But sometimes it will be a very straightforward uh, um, Vatican II um, mass, which is also totally fine with me. Mm. Because if I can choose, I would of course go for the old rite because it's more complete. It's more in detail. It's more thorough. It's the worshipping is a bit more intense. That's really, really nice. Um, so as a well-known benefactor of Catholic causes and a helper of the poor, what does your apostolate consist of? So we have at home a very nice apostolate which we have inherited from my son's great-grandfather, which is feeding the poor. They have just celebrated a hundred years of soup kitchen. We, ha we have um, dedicated the most beautiful room of, this, of the, the castle, which I hope you will come and visit one day. It's a baroque, it's the baroque refectory of the um, Benedictine monastery, because the castle where we live in today is a secularized monastery of the Benedictines, and the refectory, which is beautiful baroque, is the room where the poor people get fed every day a hot meal since 100 years. How many? About 200 to 250. 
Wow. Hot meals a day. Three causes. You, t- you take it very that's, seriously. That's apostolate because we, we think that by bringing people to the table is a very nice social way to help, to give them the feeling they are socially accepted because, of course, most of the people who cannot afford a warm meal are on the edges of society. Mm-hmm. And to be able for them to come to the castle, to sit in the most beautiful room and have lunch, is a nice thing. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, so you can, I can tell actually you're, you're incredibly passionate with helping people and you're, you're passionate about the Mass, which is, which is truly brilliant. Um, have you any other passions of the faith? And what do you particularly enjoy about uh, Catholicism or any practice? No, I really enjoy um, a good pontifical high Mass. I also like processions. I love processions. I have I have also participated in procession in New York City. Now that is something else. When you walk through the gay area of New York, for example, where these half-naked people don't know exactly what's going on, but you see that this is a procession of very dedicated people that are following the same sacrament, it touches them. What is going on? These people in their silent prayer, in their singing, no matter where you walk, the far away from Christianity people are, they will see that there's something mystical happening and they will respect it. Wow, yes, that's, that's I think you're spot on. Um, so I'd like to know who gives you inspiration from the saints or theologians? Or is there anyone today that gives your Serene Highness such inspiration? The, my main inspiration comes from the always thoroughly looking and searching for good priests. I've always done that. And I found several very good and dedicated priests who have um, inspired me and also led me, told me what I have to do. For example, the, the daily mass was proposed to me by a Monsignor and I didn't, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me before. He said to me, if you want to change your life, if you want to really have a, go to a step further, then you go to daily mass and you go to every month confession. That will change your life. And that's true. It changed my life to the positive. So that's, that. of course, it was inspiration and help of, of good priests. And then, of course, I have my favorite saints. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, having known Pope Benedict Emeritus personally, uh, how did this impact your life? Uh, Very much, because in, in the, during the time when 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 Pope Benedict was still Cardinal Ratzinger, I saw a lot of him in Germany, and he inspired me greatly. We did a pilgrimage together, uh, only he and his secretary and me, we went to a monastery in, in, in Tuscany. And we do, during these three days, I learned a lot. And also, we, when we had the opportunity to talk, the way he incorporated the life of the saints in his everyday life, that I learned also from him, not only from, also from my very pious aunt, who, who died about 30 years ago, but as a child I always thought, I always saw her praying, I, I saw her kneeling down in, before her bed in the morning and in the evening and I thought, and then I saw her praying the breviary and I saw her praying the rosary and I thought to myself, one day I want to be like that. Now I, I'm still not able to, but sometimes I did pray the rosary with her, but of course not the way she did, but it was a great thing that I saw this because it gave me something to aspire and a little bit like this also with, with Cardinal Ratzinger. He aspired and I wanted to, to become a pious person. Wow, yes, that's very good. So, um, which saint actually do you have the most recourse to? Today we have Saint Teresa of Avila. I'm a very great fan of hers, also due to her friendship 
friendship with Ignatius von Loyola because I also have many very, very good friendships with priests. And I, I, I always think about her because I think it, she had such a close friendship to Ignatius and it was she inspired the days inspired each other and I really like and I, I named my daughter after her. Okay. Then of course I have Saint Elizabeth of Hungary and Saint Elizabeth of Portugal. They are also queens king's daughters, both princesses, real princesses. And I also got very inspired by them. And then I also love very much King Ludwig of France because King Ludwig of France, like Saint Stephen from Hungary, are leaders, they are also military leaders, chief in command, and still saints, which means and shows that you can take tough decisions in life. You can command an army and remain saintly if you always re-reflect that what you do is not for your personal glory, but for the best of your people. Well, that I think is very good. Um, so moving on to some uh, away from more personal things now uh, to society at large, how do you see the German church's present situation today? The German situation doesn't come as a surprise. The Germans were always very more than liberal, progressive, I would say. Look, Luther. So we are in a perfect tradition of a protestantically influenced church and as a matter of fact many say and I also fear that in the past let's say since Vatican II we have concentrated more on becoming like the Protestants on getting closer to the Protestants rather than closer to the Orthodoxy which are our brothers because they basically believe the same thing now one has to say the Orthodox we totally fully embrace the orthodox but the orthodox don't embrace us and if you look at the church today you can also say, you must say well actually we do understand them but i think the mistake was that we didn't approach as much to the orthodoxy than we did to the protestantism and that of course colored off that colors off and that's why the german church today is very very <coughs> Protestant, if you will. Yes. Um, so do you think it's actually hard for families to bring their children up in a Catholic way nowadays in societies like this? Mm. Today, in society, yes. Today you have to, if you really want your children to be Catholic, you have to do it yourself because you are not going to get a Catholic training at school anymore. The schools today are far secularized and they only supply a framework but if I talk to my nephews and nieces or even look at my upbringing I got all my knowledge from my parents and from my aunt and from the pious people in my family and from the priests that I thoroughly interviewed and if, but if, if I was only brought up at school I wouldn't know anything so today to be a Catholic is a choice you go and you discover. And you discover a huge treasure, of course. You can also walk by it, but if you want to discover, you can discover. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we kind of touched briefly on, on this just a moment ago, but do you have any thoughts on the, uh, the, the proposed German Synod, um, where they're proposing uh, married priests, uh, even same-sex marriages, and to the extreme of women priests as well? Now, I think there is a lot of politics in this because, of course, one strategy might be for the church to be able to stay in power and to get the church taxes from the government because, you see, the concordat with, with Hitler was because the church was expropriated many times under Napoleon, that's how we got our monastery, because we got expropriated for the running of the postal service, which the government wanted to have this business. So they gave us what they before had expropriated the church. 
So that's why we end up with a with a nice castle that is a, was a monastery before. Let the memory be. So I think a lot of it is politics, Thank you. and I think um, I think that. Yes, there is a strategy behind to keep in power and to please the government because don't forget the church in Germany gets their money from the government and they do a lot of good with it. We have, of course, hospitals, we have old people's homes, we have kindergarten, they do great social work, cheaper for the government than other entities could do it. That's why this symbiosis is still in place. But of course, the church always is afraid that someday the government will decide, oh, we finish this off. And they get, the, they, they get the taxes from the government because it was a, um, well, it was a remuneration for the expropriation. That's, that's, that's why I said with Hitler, when Hitler took away all the church properties, they closed a deal with him and said, okay, you take away everything from us, but you give us so and so much percent of what the people pay tax. And at the end of the day, this was a very good idea from the church because that's how they get paid until today. But the, the, the downside of it is, or the other side of the coin is also that they might be corrupted by the money, by the government, because who you get paid by, that's the song you sing. And we are in this crooks, but I'm still am for church taxes in Germany because I always say, you can also be a very bad manager with a little amount of money. It really doesn't matter how much money it is. You can take wrong decisions with a small amount of money, and you can take wrong decisions with a larger amount of money. In Germany, we take bad decisions with, with a large amount of money. In France, we take bad decisions with a little amount of money. So at least the, ch the church can keep entities up, and but they are, of course, trying to please the government. And now back to your question. I think that a lot of this nonsense talk about women priests and, and, and cut the chastity is the trying to be like the Protestants and they think they are going to please the government and they can stay in power that way. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think so. Because they can't do it. Because there are things that you cannot undo. Mm. I think that's very uh, accurate, actually. Um, so, I was going to ask you, um, do you think uh, there is much support in Germany for societies like the Fraternity of St. Peter or the Institution of Christ the King Sovereign Prince? Mm. These institutions are, um, are organisations that are on the edges of the Catholic world. Nobody knows about them. You only find out about them if you look for them, which is a nice thing too. They are not mainstream. The mainstream church doesn't talk about them. But the mainstream church has no followers and no seminarians. When you look at those organizations, Christ the King or St. Pius, they are always full, which is a good indicator and also a proof that when you take religious seriously, you are more attractive. Mm. I was going to say, do you think there was a correlation then between um, a tradition and, and, and growth? Mm. Mm. Definitely. So tradition, anything you do with passion, you will be more successful. If you don't really believe, if you are supposed to sell wine, no. Ah, okay. And now you have to sell it as the best wine. You're going to find it difficult. But if you think, ah, oh, fantastic, then you can sell. Yes. And the same goes for religion. So, um, why do you think then um, many of the people in the West are abandoning their Christian heritage? Mm -hmm. First, because there is no proper teaching 
but also there is no proper teaching because our own clergy lost faith. It's a general movement. My personal experience, is, let's say my theory, I don't know for sure, but my theory is that humankind has conquered all the weaknesses they encountered. We have light where it was dark. We have warm where it was cold. We can eat. We can drink. We can dress. We have even the diseases we have conquered. What do we need God for? There is a regulatory process. When you, when we, you can always see when there's a big famine or when there's a war or when people are in crisis. Ah, then they remember. Oh, maybe God can help me now. Of course, we don't have to worry because God will always be happy to meet us, no matter what circumstances. Because as we know from the Gospel, whether you come late or whether you come early, you will be loved the same. So that's a, that's a good news. But I'm just saying, I think that as a, a society that is totally um, we are satisfied, will have less inclination to teach the faith, to put the faith in the number one. And that's our problem of the society today. Yes, I, I think that's, that's right. Um, so where would you actually say the most Christian country is now? And um, how do you think that they will influence the rest of the world in the society eventually? Now, very good are uh, Africa. Africa is a whole continent. I don't know of a lot of Africa, but I'm talking about Black Africa, not the Arab country. Black Africa, uh, I know Kenya, Senegal, and um, uh, these are the countries I know, and from east to west, but they tell me, and I have also met other African bishops, that in Africa the, the faith is still vivid. The people have not... Um, become slaves of, 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 of the modern world in a way they still know that God is watching above everything and they still respect God and put God in the first place and that's why these society are the ones who will go it will be in the future mission or are missionarizing us now in Germany already we have many dioceses who have priests from either India or Africa these are very, very religious people. So the future is potentially in, in Africa. Um, <clears throat> so what do you think that could be done to reverse these trends in the West? Also, of course, we need, we need more emphasis on the, the faith. We need to, to, to sell the joy of the gospel and the faith. If you think that today we heard some bishops from South America, from Brazil, who were bragging about being a missionary since 40 years and never baptized anybody. This is, has to be reversed. This is the problem, the problem. You, if you don't baptize anybody because you don't believe, it's not going to happen. First of all, we have to pray that people are believers again. That's a grace. We cannot buy this. We have to pray for it. We have to pray for the church, we have to pray for faith, and we have to pray for strong, faithful priests, ministers. And then, this will be the seeds into the ground that will make it happen again. I think. So with countries in Europe now, enacting legislation which is anti-Christian and immoral. What do you think the duty of the lay person is and how should they counter these developments? Mm. Since Vatican II, we have been told that the influence of the lay people is very important. But it's no longer only the clergy, but the lay people have a strong responsibility and our responsibility is in going out and by the way we live and by the way we act to show what 
it means or what Christianity is all about. If we are joining in the, the um, how to say, uh, pantheistic way of thinking, or if we have polygamy in our families, and if we have all the, the, the things the heathens do, then we will not be more attractive because that already exists. But when we are attractive, when we, they see, oh, this is a nice family with many children and they're having such a good time. They're helping each other and they are, they are social nucleus and they, they are not a burden on the society because they are helping each other and this is an asset for the society. This is not a burden but an asset. That way we will be able to grow. A little bit the same role as a Christian had in Roman times. And the Romans said, these strange people, but they are so happy and they have a good time and they are, they, nothing can um, frighten them. They are fantastic people after all, to go forward with a good example. Um, so with um, society now, uh, generally in the West, a lot of converts are turning towards Islam. Um, rather than uh, stay with the traditional religions. Do you think this is due to not only what we've been talking about with the lack of catechesis, um, but also uh, lukewarm Christians that don't really live the faith? That's why I'm saying the, the Muslim people are attractive to a lot because they really believe. If you really believe and if you're passionate about the faith, that is something that is very attractive to other people. They will very happily admit to pray three, four times a day when our Christian people will say, oh, they, they asked around and they found out that even priests don't pray more than once or even not once a day. So that's not very attractive. So again, like selling the good wine, the faith is the ground substance we need and we have to pray for the faith. The faith, you and I can make a change if we pray strong enough for the faith, then it will happen. So live, pray for the faith. And live the faith, yeah. So with so much discord and disharmony, mistrust, not only within Holy Mother Church, but society at large, how best can we foster true unity that we, we may all be one in Christ? What do you see your duty as in that regard? Yes, as I say, to be courageous in society when when you when we when you talk about religion, that to, that you are not scared and, and 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 shy to say what you are and why you are and what is attractive about it, that's already a big step forward. Not be silenced, but be of course if you are not persecuted politically, then we have other rules. But in in a free society, and thank God we are still in a free society. To try to to be attractive with the way you live and the way you think, people will people will feel attracted to it if you if you are thorough and if your consequences. If you don't imitate the wrong people, you will imitate the right people, and it will be attractive. And that, that can be applied to to anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you see the sexual abuse scandals and the unfair teachings of late? Uh, do you think they're contributing to undermine the church's moral authority? Mm. Needless to say, the abuse crisis is a disaster, but abuse crisis we have had to fight and to battle with all our lives since the beginning of days. More so in the past, it's coming back big because people have no respect for religion anymore. But I think um, the, the, the abuse of child is has has to do with the general moral of a society and in the church any amoral living was always condemned a huge sin but since the 60s we have had at least in germany but i know also in england and i also know in america we had a psychological movement which was called the therapy um, re the reform pedagogy, pe pedagogue, reform pedagogue, which meant 
you did not believe in a hierarchy anymore, but you believed in flat hierarchies, which means the teacher becomes your friend. And where the teacher becomes your friend, and where you don't have a teacher in front in the classroom, but he is among you in the middle, where you break up hierarchies, of course you break also up other things that in society should, should stay apart. You can facilitate this or you can make it more difficult. The, the church, the way the Catholic churches were always looking for in schooling, was to keep a straight distance between the teacher and the pupils. Of course, also in those circumstances, abuse can happen. Abuse can happen always. Why? Because the devil is everywhere. The devil is always tempting and you have to fight it. But it has a difference whether you condemn something as a mortal sin or you facilitate it because it all of a, all of a sudden becomes a fashion of the uh, of the scientific new way of psychological thinking. You get better people if you don't have hierarchies. Hierarchies are good in military and everywhere because it makes it, it gives the people discipline and it, it separates clearly the line. It will still happen anyway, but it is less facilitated. Our society, the sexual society, facilitates any kind of sexual abuse. Yes, um, that's a very good point actually. Um, it's, made, it's made me think that um, as the sexualization of society has become more liberal, um, the demands for um, more strange fantasies and fetishes have, have, have grew, where there's a growing movement now that is soliciting pedophilia not as a crime, that they're saying um, it should be solicited in some circumstances. Um, I think it's awful. Mm. And even the cult of Satan. Mm. So how do you think one can... I think we've actually covered that, sorry. Um, <clears throat> do you think the European Union is a good thing for Catholics? The idea, the idea behind the European Union is very good, it was very good. It is the, the follow-through or the put in motion or the realization of it that has big flaws. One of the big flaws is that the Christianity or the Catholic Church has been pushed aside to the point that we do not even have to swear to God when we are sworn in a big, um, an important political role um, in politics. It, it is the European Union were the first to abolish that the politician has to swear that he will be honest to God and do everything for the interest to their uh, people. The swearing on God has been abolished. That is the consequences of that we see today. There is no friendship, everybody is up to for grabs, everybody wants their own benefit, the whole European Union is not anymore a happy family because in the beginning if you don't invoke God, if you don't put God in the first place, Nothing can be successful, in my opinion. And that's also the misery of the U European Union. When you go into the building of the European, there is not even one cross. How is this going to function? We are a Christian society. We come from Judeo-Christianism. How can we reject our roots? Any society that rejects their roots will be down. So uh, leading from that then, uh, I'd be curious to know what do you think the best system of government is and, and why? Well, 
democracy has its great advantages, but it has to be a real democracy. We experience today that sometimes uh, people have to vote again, again because their governments are not happy with the result. Or they vote in a way and the other governments say, these people are stupid, they don't know what they're doing. Look at Poland, the way they, they commentary about the results in Poland, as if the Polish people are second class, they don't know what they're doing because they're still voting for conservatives. So this is not really very attractive uh, for, for, for the, for the so-called democracy. Or look at the Brexit movement, the Brexit people, they have the, the majority, the Brexit has not been delivered. So the elites of the political system caste say, ah, but they didn't know what they do. That, that, that's not real, that's not a democracy then. Because when we want to talk about a democracy, then you have to give the vote to the people, even if you don't like the result. In my family, there is no democracy. In my family, I call the shots, and sometimes I will ask and put up things for discussions, but what my experience is that as soon as you put things up for discussion, there is endless discussion and no result. I'm not saying that I'm for dictatorship, of course, I'm not saying that, but I think that the monarchy has great advantages. And But I am not an expert for ruling country, so I'm, I'm just speaking as a little housewife uh, mind, and I can only say it is very difficult to decide, but the democracy we have today is not a real democracy, in my opinion. And I think it also runs the risk of um, people voting for unnatural, to legalise unnatural vices, or euthanasia, or other such things, you know. Sometimes there could be a good safeguard with monarchy in that respect. Absolutely, because the majority isn't always right. Um, so before we end, is there anything that you would like to bring up or make known? Well, I certainly hope that you are going to be successful with your interview series and that a lot of people are going to get inspired by it and come to the faith and follow the faith and and discover the richness and the beauty of the Catholic faith. Thank you very, very much, uh, especially for all the generosity you've shown us with the time uh, allowing me to come into your apartment here. Uh, so be assured of the Convertimacy's prayers and please pray for us. Thank you. Thank you.